urges Emma John to introduce the next book on our shortlist. Thanks, Robert. Um, yes, so the next book on our shortlist is, um, well, it's about one of the most famous cricket writers of them all. Uh, it's, it's the great romantic, Cricket and the Golden Age of Neville Cardus, and it was published by Hodder and St Stoughton. It's um, compellingly written, um, and I would say that for certain readers who might not be as aware of Cardus's life as much as they're aware of his legend, it's um, a really fascinating, intriguing, sometimes astonishing insight into a man who's long loomed as large in our sport as any player. Um, and it certainly transformed my view of its subject. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the author, Duncan Hamilton. Duncan, uh, are you unmuted and, and uh, can we say hello to you? I think you can. I mean, can there, um, you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I'm going to take that to mean that everyone else can hear you too. Uh, welcome. Well, welcome to this virtual long room. Thank you. It's uh, just a shame that we weren't actually in the long room because um, I know from, uh, from kind of the past where my books have been nominated that where the lectern usually stands, where you would be giving this speech is kind of roughly where Cardis used to actually park himself when he came to games at Lords. It would have been perfect to be able to say that from the actual spot, but... So he always, he always got that best... I mean, that's basically one of the best spots in the long room, isn't it? That, that's it is. Well, of course, he was Neville Cardis, so he could do what he liked. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have written about so many fascinating cricketing personalities. Have you always had it in your mind to turn your attention to, to Cardis one day? Yes, I thought basically that, it would, that we were in that sort of situation where he would often be uh, um, quoted, but he wasn't often read, not kind of thoroughly read. And um, it, I mean, it is really odd, I suppose, for me to be sitting here now because Cardis wrote millions and millions of words and I started to read them, I think, and it was 2011. I finished the book in 2017, apart from the final chapter, which I wrote in 2018. It came out in 2019, and now it's and uh, now I'm talking about it still this rare uh, year. Um, but it, it, I mean, it was just a kind of tremendous effort of will, I suppose, more 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 than anything else, because not only did I go and read all his books, and there were a lot of his books, um, but of course he, he I mean, he was kind of writing about ten or sort of twelve thousand words a year a week on the game, in not only the Manchester Guardian as it then was but also in kind of other very obscure magazines. And when I began to sort of tot everything up, um, I thought, goodness, I've, I've, I've kind of got to look at about the sort of money that he must have earned. And he earned a tremendous amount of, of uh, cash. I mean, it, it seems really odd that he was probably one of the best paid writers, uh, uh, one of the best paid newspaper writers between the wars. And yet he ended his life with so little cash because he kept on spending it. Was it intimidating? I mean, you, you've sort of said it was, it was a big, big project to, to, to read all of his stuff. But as someone who writes about sport yourself, it, is it intimidating to write about one of the doyans of cricket writing? Absolutely. And uh, because you're always thinking, is this a kind of sentence that he would have written? And, and, and what I didn't want to do was... Um, was to kind of get into a situation where I was trying to compete with Gardas because I just wanted to record what he did, really, and to kind of write it as, as, as you know, well as I could, obviously, but to kind of make sure that there was always something of him on a page so that people could actually uh, appreciate the fact that he not only changed cricket journalism, he changed sports era journalism, absolutely. And how did your perception of him as a man change as you researched and wrote about him? Well, he was a very complicated man. I mean, uh, Mike, Mike there talks about Alistair Cook and being able to compartmentalise uh, his life. Um, I mean, Cardus did that to an extreme level. I mean, his uh, cricket friends never met his music friends unless they were obviously women, where he would take them to kind of both. And he was terribly secretive. I mean, very few people went to his went to, to his rooms, which he kept in London. 
um, very few people really went to his flat, which he which he kind of lived in towards uh, uh, towards the end of his life, and um, very few people knew him actually well. So, last question: you've you've mentioned his music. One of the themes of, of that emerges in this narrative is how highly he prized his his music writing, almost above his cricket writing. So, if you were going to write a book about music, what it, what would it be? Oh, um, jazz. I'm really a jazz person. Um, I mean, I do love classical music, um, but if I could write about Miles Z Davis, I would be very happy. Well, I mean, you know, we all look forward to reading that. Well, if they, uh, well, if there's any publishers uh, watching this, you never know. <laughs> Thanks, Duncan. I'll hand back to you, Robert. Thanks, Emma. Thank you very much, Anne. I'm looking forward already to Miles Davis and the Late Cut. Um, <laughs>